it's good to see many people out today. And I hope you will stay after the service and enjoy the food. Because we are multicultural in this church. And boy, there's an awful lot of different foods that are here. I'm going to start off with a story I've told before. But it's been a while, so most people probably have forgotten about it. This is a story about a rich man and his son. They were both avid art collectors, and their collection was well known. It contained you know, uh, good old Rembrandts and Van Goghs and Picassos. Well, anyway, what happened was a war broke out, and the son decided to join the forces. Well, he was killed about three months later. The father was informed that he died in combat and was told that he had saved lives in that combat. Well, months later, it was around Christmas time, and there was a knock at the father's front door. And there was a young man standing there, and he had a large package in his arms. And he said, sir, you don't know me, but I am the man that your son saved that day in the battle we were in. He was carrying me to safety, and he was shot in the heart. So your son saved my life. Your, your, and he mentioned that his son, or the, like his son, the old man's son, had often talked about you as his father and also about the art. And then he held out the package to the son, or to the father. And the father opened it, and in it was a portrait of the son. And when the father looked at it and gazed upon it, he was in awe, because he felt that the soldier, this young man, had gained the essence in the photograph or in the painting of his son, his personality. The father was so drawn to the eyes, are we having trouble up there, Ian? <laughs> that he, his own eyes started to well up. He thanked the young man and offered to pay him for the portrait. Oh, no, sir, I never could repay your son for what he did for me. It is a gift. So the father ended up hanging it right over his mantle of his fireplace. And anybody that came in to visit him, first thing he showed them was this portrait. Now, with, even with all the famous paintings he had, that was always second with him. It was always show the son first. Anyway, what happened? A few months later, the old man died. And then there was an auction to being held to sell off the man's paintings and other artifacts that he had in his collection. So many influential people came to the auction, of course, because they wanted to see these various priceless objects, but also wanted to buy them, some of them, because they had exactly what they might be looking for. So the auctioneer pounded his gavel, will start the bidding, and of course what's on the podium, the first painting, is the painting of the son. And of course many people were astonished at this. But he said, we'll start with the son's painting. Well, a voice from the back room shouted, we want to see the old masters, not this portrait. Skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? And there was dead silence. Nothing was said. Who will start the bidding at $200? No response. How about 100 Another angry voice came up from the back. We didn't come to see this painting. We want to see the masters. Get on with the auction. But the, still the auctioneer continued. The son. Who will take the son? Finally, an elderly gentleman in the back row who happened to be the gardener for the, for the old man said, I don't have much money, but I, all I can offer is $10. So the auctioneer said, fine, and said, $10, do I hear 20? Shouts arose, give it to him for $10. The crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want the son. They wanted to bid on the more worthy paintings in the old man's collection. 
So what did the auctioneer do? Going once, going twice, sold for $10. Now a man in the second row shouts out, now we can have a real auction. Well, the auctioneer put down his gavel. I'm sorry, but the auction is over. When I was conducting, or was asked to conduct this auction, I was told a secret stipulation, which I was not allowed to reveal until after the sale of the portrait of the sun. And the stipulation was, only the painting of the sun would be sold and auctioned off. And whoever bought the portrait of the sun would inherit the entire estate, including all the paintings. The man who took the sun gets everything. God gave everyone here in the sanctuary today and every person has ever lived or will live on this earth. His son, Jesus, who 2,000 years ago was willing to die on a cross for our sins. And it is up to each individual as to whether they accept or reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Much like the auctioneer, his message was and is today the son who will take the son. Like the bidders at the auction who were more interested in the worldly paintings and ignored the portrait of the son, today people are more interested in the things of this world than in the son of God. Communion is all about Jesus and what he did for us. If we're focused on Jesus, the minor issues going on in this world shouldn't distract us from fulfilling God's plan for each one of our lives. Yes, God has a plan for you, but he has given you a free will to choose his path or to choose any path you want to lead. Communion was created by our triune God as a way for Jesus' followers to remember his great self-sacrifice and his resurrection. Communion is a celebration, remembrance, and proclamation of Jesus' death. It is a reminder to us and a declaration to his followers that Jesus was with us, Jesus died for us, rose from the dead, and now he's alive and working in us through the presence of the Holy Spirit that's living in us. We are here this morning to celebrate and remember through the partaking of communion what Jesus did on the cross for each one of us. Why? Because we chose to take the Son. We chose to follow Jesus. So how do we define communion, a ritual that has been central to the worship life of Christians dating back to the beginning of Christianity? A Christian sacrament in which bread and wine are consumed as memorials of Christ's death on the cross or as symbols for the realization of a spiritual union between Christ and a communicant or as the body and the blood of Christ. Another meaning, the sharing or exchanging thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. Communion literally means sharing. It's breaking bread together. The word communion comes from the King James Version Bible translation of the word for sharing, which Paul used in describing the taking of bread and wine as the body of the bl and blood of Jesus. The Latin root word is communis, which means participation by all. Communion is supposed to bring together everyone and as one body, and that's in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, but we all partake of the one bread. By observing communion, we are remembering Jesus. We are also to take time to examine ourselves before we take an active role in communion. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 and 29. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For if anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. The communion celebration in Corinth was getting out of hand as recorded in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 22. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better 
but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe in part, for there must be factions among you in order to, that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you have no houses or not houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. The people were not treating communion as a sacred ordinance instituted by Jesus. Instead of remaining people or reminding people of Jesus' great sacrifice, communion became a big party. They were just there for the fun, to enjoy, a good, have a good time. Not really sharing. Self-centeredness played a major role in what was going on. Family, do we uh, do a heart check on ourselves before we take communion? Something to think about. And I'm going to say, ask these questions of yourself. Do I accept and believe that the word of God, who's Jesus, was made flesh, lived among us, and, su and suffered for my sins in the human form and died on a cross for me? Do we believe that? Do I believe that Jesus' shed blood was to remove the stain of my sins and make an atonement to God? Do I have unconfessed sins in my life right now that I need to repent to God for? A non-believer in, in this situation may not have a true sense of sin in his life. Therefore, he may not feel the need to feel remorse or a reason to repent. Therefore, he won't see a need to have Jesus in his life as Savior, or to be thankful for him for his redemption. All these elements are important when we partake in, commun in communion service. It's a command that we remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Remember G that Jesus is the one who provides all our needs, both physical and spiritual. Are our hearts right with the Lord today? Or do we have a problem with a brother or sister? Perhaps we're not showing a heart of forgiveness, have unconfessed sin. Many churches today precede the passing of the elements with two warnings. Don't take communion unless you're a follower of Christ. It's too precious an act to be treated as a meaningless religious ritual. And that's what happens in many churches. It's strictly a ritual they do. It doesn't really have any meaning. Be sure you're up to date with God, you know, regarding your own unconfessed sin or unsurrendered dark areas in our lives. Having an unforgiving spirit, you're, or you say you hold grudges against a family member, a friend, or an acquaintance. For situations that happened a long time ago. I just can't forgive him for what he did. So what does Jesus say about that? Matthew 6, 14 and 15. Let you, excuse me, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. How are you going to explain your unforgiveness to, of others that have offended you to Jesus when you stand before the great white throne of judgment? Because if you're standing at the great white throne, it's already too late to forgive them and repent of your own sin. 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32. But if we judge ourselves, truly we will not be judged by the Lord. We are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Jesus allowed himself to be put on that cross and be crucified to signify, seal, and apply to all believers the benefits of his new covenant. In this ordinance, Jesus ratified his promise to his people, and they are for, his, or for their part to solemnly consecrate themselves to him and to his 
entire service. As Christians, celebrating the Lord's Supper is one of the most important things we can do together. By proclaiming that only Jesus, we can hope to receive forgiveness and grace to live the life that Jesus wants us to. By partaking of the bread and the wine, we are to remember all that Jesus has done for each one of us. If we can truly look at ourselves and judge ourselves, seeing the sins we have committed and repenting of them, God will forgive us. God won't condemn us, but he may discipline us. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. In this passage, God chose David over Saul. Why? The people wanted a king, and God gave them Saul, because Saul represented what the people truly wanted in a king, because they looked at their neighbors. God chose David because he was a man after God's own heart. Saul disobeyed God's commands, and David listened and obeyed. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. He did not choose because of looks or outer appearance, but what was in the man's heart. And when he came, this is Acts 13 or 13:22. And when he came, when he had removed him, I should say, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified, and I said, "Have found in David the son of Jesse a man after my own heart." So what qualifies David to be called a man after God's own heart? Well, it already says that in, in verse 22 who will do all my will. He has total faith in God and his instructions. That's the way David was. He loved God's laws. You can tell that when you look at the book of Psalms. You know, David wrote more than 75 Psalms. In Psalm 119, 47 to 48, it says, For I find my delight in your commands, which I love, I lift up my hands towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. If we as believers follow the same path as David took and love God as David did, would we be better Christians? Have a better relationship with God? Think about that. What's our relationship with God like today? Are we just here on a Sunday and go home and that's it? We don't open our Bibles. We don't pray. We don't take time to be with God and listen to what he has to say to us. These are all things that we, because of the world we live in today, we fail in, in a lot of cases. We have to remember that Jesus came to earth as a servant and not a warrior king. The Messiah the Jews were looking forward to coming to free them from their oppressors, the Romans. They were looking for a warrior king, not a, a servant. And Jesus came as a servant, and he always acted as a servant. 1 Peter 2, 21-22. For this you have been called, because Christ has suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, Neither was deceit found in his mouth. Suffering is a mysterious thing. Everyone will suffer from something painful at one time or another in our lives. We may experience major setbacks in our physical health. The loss of a loved family member, a friend, or perhaps being socially distanced from these same people because of our Christian values and beliefs. Suffering is real, and it is painful. Jesus felt suffering, the only man that ever lived that never committed a sin. Scripture teaches, Romans 3.10, 
As it is written, none are rich, righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Only Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life, yet he suffered the most of anyone. If the perfect Son of God suffered for us, and he is our example of living the perfect life, how can we in our imperfect state expect not to suffer during our lifetime? Sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, and mankind has felt the effects of that sin ever since. Suffering can be the result of personal pride, greed, an unforgiving attitude, or even our own foolishness. But the Bible contains great news for believers. Suffering is only temporary. Though the death and resurrection of Jesus, eternal suffering, or through the, the death and resurrection of Jesus, eternal suffering was defeated. We may suffer today, but it will not last forever. Revelation 21.4 He will wipe every tear away. From their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. What a glorious promise that God is making in this verse. God will end all tears, mourning, crying, and pain. We'll be in heaven with God and the heavenly host. God has covered us with his righteousness. And he's also covered us with his grace. People are made right with God by God's grace, which is a free gift. We may make right, or be made right with Jesus by being freed from sin through Jesus. God sent Jesus as a way for man to have his sins forgiven through faith in him. All this is possible through the spilled blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2.5 even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. We are spiritually dead because of the things we did wrong against God. Yet God gave us a new life with Jesus. Insurance companies today talk about new insurance for old coverage. God offers us a new clean life for our old soiled one. It does not depend on the quality of the soiled life. God makes an unconditional offer. The worse life, the better this offer is. So that means anyone can come. Too often people today think, oh, God will never forgive me. And that's pride, as far as I'm concerned, because God is willing to forgive anybody. And we have to remember that no matter what you've done, you can still be forgiven. And anyone can apply. Now, how's that for an answer? Anyone can apply. It's not something that oh, only Christians, people that go to church. God will accept any offer made in good faith. All we have to do is accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior and repent of our sins. It sounds hard when we have to do that sort of thing sometimes. And there's one condition. It's a non-refundable deal. We all have to do, all we have to do is accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and repent of our sins. That's all we have to do and mean it. I mean, it's, we sometimes hear people will speak the words in, in, when they're doing a prayer and they don't really mean it in their hearts. Well, God knows whether you mean it or not. If you truly mean in your heart that you want to accept Christ and you are sorry for what you've done, you will be forgiven because that's the way God is. God will not give us back our old soiled life. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is the gift of a new life because of the spilt blood of Jesus. It is free to us but it was very expensive for Jesus. It cost us what we don't need, our sin and death. It cost Jesus everything he had. 
Our salvation begins at the cross, but Christ continues to nourish believers with his crucified body and shed blood. Just as our daily meals give us strength for our physical life, so also does the regular celebration of Jesus' death and resurrection nourishes the spiritual lives of all those who have faith in Christ. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Come to me, all who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we contemplate this weekend on the death and resurrection of Jesus, let us keep our hearts centered on the true covenant. The blood of Jesus is a celebration of victory over the devil, power over sin, and peace in our hearts. Let's just bow our heads. Lord God, Eternal Father, we praise and thank you for your grace that through your Son, Jesus, you established this supper in which we eat his body and drink his blood. By your Holy Spirit, help us to use this gift to confess and forsake our sins, to confidently believe that we are forgiven through Christ, and to grow in faith and love day by day until we come at last to the joy of eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord.